Welcome to the Radically Christian Bible Study Podcast. I'm your host, Wes McAdams. Here we have one goal, learn to love like Jesus. Who is a minister? Is it just the people who are financially supported by the church, or is it every follower of Jesus? Today's Bible study will reveal why every Christian should think of themselves as a minister and their workplace as a place of ministry. My guest today is my friend Rusty Tugman. Here's what Rusty has to say about his life and his work. He said, After 30 years in full-time ministry, 21 as the preacher for the Alameda Church of Christ in Norman, Oklahoma, I became the leadership trainer and workplace coach for the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. I'm also a trainer for Strata Leadership, a true dad's educator, and the owner of Tugman Coaching and Consulting, LLC. And I still preach, but now as a guest preacher, he says, I've never left full-time ministry. I just changed context. But before we get into my conversation with Rusty, I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim his excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I hope that you enjoyed today's conversation, and I pray that it helps all of us learn to love like Jesus. Rusty Tugman, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks, Wes. I'm honored to be on. Thanks for inviting me. Man, it's good to have you. I'm, I'm really excited about having this conversation. You and I get to hang out at uh, Camp Blue Haven every summer, and and I I just I've I've grown so much from your wisdom and from our friendship, and so I'm excited for other people to to hear your thoughts today. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I've I've had so much fun hanging out with you at Blue Haven, and and it's been good to just get to know you and develop our friendship. Likewise. So I want to talk about ministry. And, and I think when we hear that word ministry, we automatically think about people that are working for a church full time or part time. Mm-hmm. And we think about ministry in those terms. Um, and, and in fact, one time I remember I was preaching and I, I was talking about how your, your, your preacher may be a minister, but he's not the minister. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, but we, we tend to attach that term, the minister, to a preacher or somebody that, that is in that sort of, quote unquote, full time ministry. Um, but I think there's a better way to think about that. And that's what I want to talk about today. But maybe the best way to do that is you tell, tell us about your story in ministry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you're exactly right. I mean, that's how I've thought of it. That's how a lot of us think of it. And so, yeah, so recently... I've kind of had a transition in my life that's made me rethink all of that. And so, um, you, you know, the pandemic changed a lot of things in our world. Um, and it made us rethink a lot of things, including church, what it means to be the church, how we go about doing church, so to speak. And so I remember during the pandemic, you know, I'm sitting there in my nice church office and I'm waiting for the world to come to me, and I'm thinking, they're not coming to me anymore. And But it also made me realize, just as a preacher, how I have allowed myself to just kind of be swallowed up in that church bubble where most of my interactions, you know, were with church members and Christians and all of those kinds of things. And 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 so that really just started to, to kind of gnaw at me. And so I started praying and and really discerning about just the, this idea that, man, I, I need to get out there. I need to go to where the world is and uh, and and truly live out the Great Commission, um, perhaps in ways that I haven't before. And so I started praying a lot about that. And, and really, that process of prayer and discernment was about a year-long process. And so as I'm going through that process, an opportunity came along to join the learning and employee development team at the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. And so I've, I've had a background in leadership and through the years, I've, I've done a lot of leadership training with different groups and nonprofits and things like that. And it, it just seemed like a really great fit and a great answer to this prayer that I've been praying. And so after about 30 years of full-time church work, 
Um, I transitioned into a secular role, secular environment, but for the purpose of ministry. And so what I tell people is that, you know, I didn't leave full-time ministry. I just changed context. And so that's kind of how I view it. And, uh, and, the, and it's been wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm able to have conversations with people that I would never have crossed paths with. I'm able to have an audience with people that I would never have had an audience with before. And the ministry opportunities are just, have, have been amazing. And so, um, so what I do there is I, I do leadership training and coaching for their supervisors, managers, and executives. And it's a, it's an organization of about 6,200 employees. So a lot of people. Um, and in fact, I've, I'm right now working on, uh, just developing an internal coaching program there. And so a lot of great opportunities, but, um, but it definitely, uh, just has, you know, shaken up my world, but it's just really caused me to rethink our approach to work, to ministry, like you said, who is a minister? What does that look like in the real world? Yeah. Well, I, th I think about what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He's talking about Jesus giving gifts to the church, mm -hmm. and specifically the gifts that he gives are apostles and uh, evangelists. But he says about shepherds and teachers that their job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, that every saint, every Christian should be a minister, and that it's the job of the church workers <laughs> to yeah. equip the members, to equip the saints, the Christians, the disciples for that work of ministry. And I mean, I think it would change the way that we think about so many things. I think it would change the the concept we have of the church, like what is the church? We, we often pay lip service to the idea that we are the church, the people are the church, but we we have this very institutionalized way of thinking about the church. I remember one time I was on social media and someone was, you know, asking for help, needing help with something. I don't know if it was financial or needing somebody to do something for them. And one of the members of our congregation commented and said, you should ask the church and see if they can help. And I thought, what a weird way to say that. Right. Because you are the church. Yeah. What she meant was ask the people in leadership to mm -hmm. see if the church collectively could help you. But she was removing herself mm -hmm. from that that equation. And that's so often what we do. We think about the people that are financially supported or the people that are in leadership roles. These are the ministers. These are the people that that are running the, you know, I, I don't know how we even, how we even conceptualize it, but we take ourselves, the members take themselves out of the equation and they, they think of the, the church as this business or this organization that they financially support, but it's the business or organization that's doing these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And that way of thinking, it also causes us to separate out our lives into church mm -hmm. and work and that these are completely different things. And there's a lot of danger in that, I think. And I think we miss a lot of opportunities that God is putting in our path to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to tell others about Jesus, to help disciple others and to make disciples because of that way of thinking. I don't want to go down a rabbit trail with, with the money aspect of things, but I think it even goes into the way that we think about church funds. Like we often say that this is God's money. And I'm like, you know what? The money in your pocket is also God's money. The money in your bank account is also God's money. And and yes, this is money that we put in the collection plate or that we give to the collective church. We're, we're sharing these funds and we're doing something collectively with these. And so there is a place, I think, for for people in quote unquote church work. I like the way you said that. There is a place for that, that all the members collectively share their funds to support this person's work and their ministry, but we can't, the, the person in the pew can't remove themselves from that process and start to think that, well, I, I gave my money, so now it's his job, it's their job to do these things. They have to see that this is a, a cooperative work that yeah. we're doing, not just in financially supporting something, but like you said, every single day when we go to work, we're on mission for God. We're we're part of we're, we are the church. You're, mm -hmm. You are the church, whether it's Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday and whether you're in the building or you're out in the community. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And so when I was making this transition and, and by the way, I, I am so 
grateful that I've been able to be a full-time minister and and have decades, you know, of of service in that way. Um, and I still preach, um, you know, a guest preach and interim preaching and things like that. So I still get to scratch that itch a little bit, but I'm so grateful that I had that. But this has been so rejuvenating for me um, and has really helped me to see things in, in, in a lot bigger way. And so, you know, for example, I think about, because I had to think about just rethink work, okay, because I'm leaving all I've known. I mean, all I've ever worked at up until this point has been in church. I mean, even from a young age, I was doing internships and all of that. So my, nearly my whole working life has been in a church setting. And so now transitioning out of that, I really had to rethink, okay, w- what is work? What, what is it about? How does this fit in, um, you know, to what God has called me to do? And so in my study of that, I went to a couple of places and it's just this is just kind of getting to that divide that you you've spoken of that we kind of sometimes you know think about you know that uh, you, you know kind of church well that's ministry you know work over here is not but that's not supported by scripture so I think about like Romans twelve one you know where Paul you know tells us to present our whole selves as living sacrifices that this is really what worship is about. And in that context, you know, what he's saying is that our proper response to our Creator is the shaping of our total lives by God's gracious will. And so there's no separation there. There's no compartmentalization that every area of our life is to be formed by and shaped by the grace of God. But then I think a clearer picture of that and, and how work fits into life is in the creation narrative. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think a lot of people, we, we look at work and we, you know, we think that it's just kind of this necessary evil. You know, we kind of have this love-hate relationship with work. And I, I remember as a kid growing up in rural Oklahoma, my dad making me get out and work on our land. And especially during the hot summers, I could have sworn at that time in my life that work was from the devil. You know, and and that's a lot of times how we see work is that, well, it must be a product of the fall and in the curse and that work was born out of the brokenness of sin. But when you go back and look at the creation narrative, work is actually born out of God's blessing, not sin's brokenness, because in Genesis one and two, work is given before the fall. And so, and, but also work in that narrative, it's given for human flourishing, that this is a good thing and it's good for us. And so when I look at work through the creation narrative, through Romans 12, 1, of course, there's other passages that we could, you know, cite and look at. But when I look at work through, through that lens, I want to embrace work as a gift from God that's good for me. It's good for me to work. Work is good for me. But also, I want to approach work as um, as just an extension of my walk with God. And, and when I do that, now work becomes something different. Then it actually becomes more exciting because if I look at, if I put work in that perspective and look at it through that lens, well, now work is a pathway for me to glorify and honor God. It's an arena where I demonstrate my trust in God and my allegiance to God, but also it's a mission field where I can live out the disciple-making mission that we've been given. Well, now work is not just this mundane thing that I have to do to pay the bills. It's exciting, and there's, there's so many opportunities that come with work to be on mission for God. And a great example of this is several years ago, I got to be part of a small group of preachers who had a meeting with Shadonke Johnson, who does a lot of work with the Renewed Network. And he's a disciple maker in Sierra Leone, leads a disciple making movement. But he, he's been to America many, many times. And he was talking to us about just our proclivity as Americans to always introduce ourselves by what we do for a living. You know, or we'll even ask, you know, uh, you know, like, hey, what do you do for a living? You know, and then we respond by literally saying what we do for a living. 
He said, if you were to, if you were to come to Sierra Leone, and if you were to ask the members of our congregation that question, what do you do for a living? He said, nearly all of them would respond in the same way, and they would respond by first saying, I'm a disciple maker who? So I'm a disciple maker who drives a taxi. I'm a disciple maker who's a doctor. I'm a disciple maker who works in a factory. I'm a disciple maker who's a baker. And man, I just remember, you know, all of us preachers who were there, I mean, we were just blown away. And I thought, that's it. That's what I want to do. That's how I want to approach work, because I think that's how Scripture approaches work. I remember hearing a lesson one time. I was probably in high school, very similar to what you just, the picture you just painted. And the the preacher said something that shocked me, and it, he, he meant for it to be provocative. He said, you can't be a Christian and a doctor. You can't be a Christian and a policeman. You can't be a Christian and a, and a garbage man. And we were like, why is he saying that? And then he said, you have to be a Christian doctor, a Christian policeman, a, a, a Christian yeah. a garbage collector, that, that your Christianity, your discipleship has to be part of mm-hmm. that. But I love that idea, what you just said, taking that even further, that it isn't just that I'm being a disciple of Jesus while I am in this, mm-hmm. this career or while I'm in the workplace, but that I'm actually being a disciple maker and that I'm actually trying to make disciples while I am doing the job that I'm doing. So mm-hmm. I love your thoughts around Daniel and how Daniel gives us a pattern and a picture for being on mission for God mm-hmm. while we're in the workplace. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I love the story of Daniel. And and Daniel has been obviously an inspiration, you know, for for, you know, thousands and thousands of years, you know, to Christ's followers. And so as I was making this transition from full-time church ministry to now going to work in a completely different environment, different role, all of that, I really wanted to go into that in a purposeful way. And so I turned to Daniel um, and, you know, just to just to kind of learn some lessons because, you know, Daniel, he's in a foreign land. Well, I was going into a an environment that was very foreign to me. <laughs> But Daniel did that in such a God-honoring way, and that's exactly what I wanted to, to do. And so I turned to Daniel for, for some lessons, and, and man, I learned so much. And one of the first things that stood out to me when I just went back to his story and started reading it and studying it is that God will put us in secular environments. And that's okay, because there's a purpose for us being there. And sometimes I think, you know, we, we lament where we're at. And when we do, we miss the purpose that God may have for us to be there. Um, I'm sure Daniel did not want to be where he was. You know, none of the Israelites did, but God placed them there. But he also had a specific purpose for them, had a specific calling for them in that context and a mission to fulfill. And Daniel is just a great example of just embracing that calling, embracing that mission, and embracing even where he was. And so his location did not change his allegiance to God. And even though he's in a foreign kingdom and eventually serving a foreign king, his allegiance is always to God. Well, how did he do that? And that's what I wanted to figure out. And so when I looked at Daniel, several things stood out to me. And, and I think one is that you think that Daniel, he was commendable. You know, at the very beginning of his story, you know, he and a few others, they're chosen. And, you know, some versions actually use the word, you know, commended or commendable uh, because of his abilities, but also because of his outstanding character. And so I think you know, as Christians in the workplace, I want to be commendable, not in the sense of, you know, I want to be, I want praise to be heaped on me, but being commendable in our, in our abilities, but also in our character, it makes us stand out, but we're standing out to bring glory to God. And so what that helped me to do is it helped me to realize that 
the greatest thing that I can bring into this workplace that I'm stepping into is not my degrees, but it's my character. And, and I think that's true for all of us that, you know, a lot of us, I mean, man, we bring so many, you know, education, experience, and all of that, but don't underestimate the power and the contribution of your character as a Christian in the workplace. Um, and so that's what Daniel brought, and, and he, so he was commendable. You know, I also think, too, just in Daniel's story is that, you know, he was competent. He was good at what he did. And, and you, know, you think of, of, of Daniel's perspective, it seems to me that Daniel kind of had this mentality that he wanted to do excellent work in order to praise an excellent God. And, and I think, wow, that, that's a great perspective for us to have is we ought to want to be good at our jobs, be competent. And, and so one of the ways that I can live out my faith in a secular work environment is to be a good employee, you know, to, to be responsible, to be trustworthy, um, to be dependable, y you know, that I, I want to be that employee that my boss doesn't have to worry about because, you know, he or she can trust me. Um, and I want to do good work as, as an extension of my service to a good God. Um, if, if you're a boss, be a good boss and treat your employees well care about your employees, have compassion on them, have empathy, you know, for them. So be competent, be good at what you do. And I think sometimes we, we think that, well, you know, for us to say we're good at this or that or whatever, that, that feels a little selfish. And, and so we're not boasting, but we're saying, hey, I want to be good because this is an extension of my walk with God. Um, you know, just like what Paul says in, in Colossians 3, 17, you know, do everything in the name of Christ. And so if I'm to take that literally, then I want to be good at my job. I want to do good work and make good contributions. Um, you know, I also see in the story of Daniel that, you know, he was convicted. I mean, we see that all throughout his story. And in a secular environment, you're going to be tempted to compromise your values your beliefs, your standards. Um, Daniel was placed in so many different situations where he could have been tempted to compromise. Um, but also, when you look at Daniel's story, Daniel had enemies. And so Daniel had, had people who were actively working against him because of his faith. Well, we may encounter that as well in a secular work environment. There may be people who actively work against us and try to sabotage us or undermine us because of our faith and our allegiance to Christ. But through all of that, Daniel stayed true to his convictions. Um, and, then, and then I also just think about, to me, Daniel teaches me to, to be Christ. And, and I know Daniel's story comes before the incarnation of Christ, but I think about like in Matthew 25, you know, when Jesus is, is, is saying, you know, talking about how, you know, when you, you, know, you, give, you, you give food, you know, you give shelter, you, you know, you visit me, you, you know, that we're doing it for him. And so I think be Christ by serving others. And, you know, Daniel, he served, he did it in the name of God for the glory of God. And what's interesting is that several times in Daniel's story, Nebuchadnezzar confesses that Daniel's God is the true God of gods and Lord of lords. And it's because Daniel, through his character, through his competency, through the strength of his convictions, he made God known to Nebuchadnezzar and others, and they saw God because of Daniel. Well, that's exactly why God has the Israelites in Babylon, is so that they can show God. And that's what Daniel does. And so I, I just thought his story and the way he approaches work as, tr as a true mission, man, that was so inspiring to me. And it really helped me to craft the way that I want to approach work in a secular environment. Oh, man, I love I love that. I, 
And I, I can see that pattern that you laid out. I see that pattern not only in Daniel's life, but even in what Paul taught the, the first century church, the way that he taught them to live when he, he was talking to slave masters or to mm-hmm. slaves and, and telling them how, how to live out their faith within the context of, of those relationships or husbands and wives and children. And in all of those contexts, this is the way you live out your faith. And, and so much of it was because he knew not only for their own sake, but for the sake of their influence, that they were going to be influencing other people, that people were going to draw conclusions about what sort of people are these Jesus followers, what sort of people are these based on the way that they live their lives. And I was just thinking about how the fact, I was thinking about the fact that the world was turned upside down, not primarily by church workers, people that were supported by local congregations to, to preach messages on Sunday. The, the world was turned upside down by ordinary, everyday yeah. disciples, followers of Jesus, living out their faith, being yeah. Christian bakers and Christian blacksmiths and Christian whatever, yeah. Christian wives and Christian children and Christian fathers and living out their faith in all of these contexts. And it it changed the world. It turned the world upside down by people living this out in everyday life. That's right. And and people notice that. And so I'll just give you a couple of examples. You know, so one of my favorite stories so far is that, um, so so there was a person that, you know, that I'm working with, um, you know, in this secular job, you know, in this secular environment. And uh, he knew he knew my background as a preacher. And so he felt compelled to tell me that he was an atheist. And he's like, okay, you know, but anyways, we, we worked together and, and worked together really well and, and, you know, hit it off and, you know, had a good connection and all of that. So at one, one point he comes to me and he wants to know about forgiveness. And so he asked me about forgiveness. Well, you know, what I know of forgiveness is how scripture teaches forgiveness, you know? So I begin to, you know, to, to kind of teach a lesson, so to speak, you know, um, uh, the, the Christian standard of forgiveness and, and how, how, you know, how Christianity defines forgiveness, things like that. So we're talking about forgiveness. And so anyway, so I'm just thinking, okay, he was just interested in this topic and I mean, we had a great conversation and all that. A couple of months go by, he reaches out to me and he says, hey, do you have time for a, a you know, a quick call? Um, and uh, we, we use Microsoft Teams, so a video call. And you have time for a quick teams call. I'm like, sure. So anyway, so I get on this call and he says, Hey, I just wanted to share something with you. And he says, It's pretty exciting to me. I couldn't wait to share it with you. I said, Okay, yeah, what's going on? And he said, Well, I just wanted you to know that I was able to forgive my mother. And he had had some issues and things, you know, through childhood and all. And I said, Wow, that's huge. You know, well, tell me about it. And so he's just telling me about the experience, and you could just see that this huge weight had been lifted off of him, and he he said, you know, I never would have been able to do that if it hadn't been for our conversation about forgiveness. And I mean, I am just, you know, sorry, get teared up thinking about it, because I'm sitting there thinking, well, we're just having, he's just interested in the topic of forgiveness. And we're just, I had no clue that all this other stuff is happening in his background and in his life. And so when he calls and says that, it was just one of those moments where you just go, okay, this is what I, I'm where I need to be. And, you know, and so that, that's not to pat myself on the back, but it's just to say exactly what you said, the influence that we can have as Christ's followers for the purpose of Christ is incredible if we will take the mission of Christ seriously and instead of compartmentalizing our lives between church and work, but see that it's all together. We have opportunities like this all the time. I have people at a state government agency, maybe I shouldn't be saying this on a podcast, I don't know, but who call me and just ask me to pray for them. Well, that's, you know, I'm not advertising that, or, you know, I don't have some sign that says, hey, you know, if you need prayer, call. It's just, but it's just, there's, 
they're seeing Christ and they're responding to that. And, and again, that's not highlighting myself, but it's to say that's that's God will put us in secular environments for this exact purpose to show Christ. And when we when we lift up Christ, he does exactly what he promised he would do. He draws people to himself if we, his followers, will lift him up. Hello, I'm David Shannon, president of Freed Hardeman University. Have you ever wanted to visit the Bible lands and place your feet on the same land that Jesus, Peter, or Paul walked? I had the opportunity to do that, and it is an amazing experience. It even impacts the way that you read Scripture. If this has been a dream for you, the Graduate School of Theology would like to invite you into a wonderful program. It's a 10-day program where you'll get to see some amazing sites throughout the biblical lands, but you'll also be a part of an archaeological dig, and all of this for only an additional $500. You'll receive credit hours for the short course, and because of generous donors that want you to have this experience, you can have this in a very affordable cost. You'll be able to see places like the Sea of Galilee and Galilee and Capernaum and the Valley of Elah. You'll even have the opportunity to worship with the brethren in Nazareth and even worship at the Garden of Gethsemane. Listen, there'll be so much to see, but even to do. The archeological dig, it's at Shiloh, the place where the tabernacle stood for 300 years. What an amazing once in a lifetime opportunity that will impact the rest of your life. If you have interest, contact us at gradstudies at fhu.edu or reach us on our website. Listen, if this is your dream, we would love to help you make your dreams come true. I was thinking, I don't know that we defined the word minister earlier, but I mean, it just means to serve, to, right. to minister to people is to serve people. Mm -hmm. And if we see, if every single one of us, I, I am in full-time church work and my work is a ministry, but so is your work a ministry. And so is the, the work of the the, our sister who works at the front desk at the mm -hmm. church building, her work is a ministry, and so is the person who works yeah. at the, the government agency and the person who works the school. Their work is a ministry, mm -hmm. and they're serving people, not just to serve them. Anybody can serve, mm -hmm. but as you said, serving in the name of Jesus. And yeah. that service in the name of Jesus, it draws people to Jesus. I think so often when we think about our work, especially quote-unquote secular work, mm -hmm. and we divide it, we just are trying to get through it, and we're just yeah. trying to keep our head above water and, and just get through it and move on to things that are more important. Whereas if we really adopted this way of thinking that you're promoting, that I think Scripture promotes, mm -hmm. is seeing our work as a ministry to reach and influence other people. So what advice would you have for people that they really want to reach their neighbors. They want to reach yeah. their coworkers, but they're not really sure how to go about that in the workplace. Yeah, well, and, and before I answer that, I just want to go back to something you mentioned that, you know, earlier you were talking about how sometimes we think of, you know, the minister as we kind of leave it all to one person, you know, and all yeah. that. But what you just described, okay, just think about if we're truly doing that, think about the reach that we would have as the church. That that if if we if we're not just putting this on the shoulders of of one person or one specialized group of paid ministers, but instead every Christ follower is seeing that they have a mission to live out in their different contexts. Now think of all the people that we're able to reach for the cause of Christ, because you know, I mean, you'll reach people that I'll never have the opportunity to meet or talk to, you know, I'll reach people that you'll never have the opportunity to meet. Talk. But if we're both doing that, now all of a sudden the kingdom is expanding, you know, and so I, I, I just think about just the possibilities of what you described. And to me, that's so exciting. Um, and, and I think it's exciting to be part of the cause of Christ and to see that I can be part of it in my work that I don't have to leave what I've known and, and go. I can be part of the cause of Christ right where I'm at. And that is really exciting to me. 
But to kind of to get to your question about just, you know, how, okay, how do we reach people, you know, in our work environments? So I think about, again, the story of Daniel, you know, that's part of a larger story. So you think of, you know, one of Daniel's contemporaries, Jeremiah. Think about what, what God says to the Israelites in Jeremiah 29, where he says, you know, you know, I have a plan for you. You know, he's put them in this secular environment, but he has a purpose for them. And so he tells them to, you know, to, to work, to, to marry, to have children, to, to live their lives. But he also tells them to seek the welfare of the city where they've gone because they'll benefit from that too. And then he also tells them to pray for the welfare of the city where they've been placed. And so if I take that and put it in, in my context, well, then it, it tells me a couple of things. It teaches me a few things about how I can reach people in my environment or be on mission in, in my secular work place. And so one is, I think, just accept the assignment. You know, I mean, in Jeremiah 29, God's given the Israelites an assignment. Okay, you're in this foreign place. You're in this secular kingdom. But God has given them an assignment to live out while they're there. So that's the first thing is I've got to accept the assignment that God has given me as a Christ follower. That assignment is true for us no matter where we are, no matter what we do for a living. Um, and it, it really kind of you know it goes to our identity that being that disciple maker, you know, and that's what I love about that story with Shadonke Johnson. You know, I'm a disciple maker who? Because what they're doing is they're identifying themselves first as a disciple maker, then secondarily I do this for, you know, to make a living. Okay, so I accept the assignment. And so I'm going to be on mission um, for Christ. So again, just going from Jeremiah 29, well, if I put that in my context, then I want to be part of the team. And that's what God tells the Israelites. Be part of the community. You know, he, he don't separate yourself off. Um, you know, make yourself this own little clique. He's saying, be part of the community, be part of the city. So I want to be part of the team. I want to be with the team. You know, I want to be alongside the team. Um, and so be part of the team that you work with, you know, at work. Um, but also be a blessing to the team. That's what God was telling the Israelites to do. Be a source of blessing to the people that you're around in, in the city you live in. And, and so, you know, in work, okay, how can I be a blessing to the people I work with and to the team I'm on, you know, and, and I think about that in terms of how, how do I add value? You know, what value can I add to this team? Um, and then also pray for your team. So just as God told the Israelites, pray for the welfare of the city. And I want to pray for my team. I want to pray for their welfare. And I do, I pray for my team by name and I pray for the things that they have going on in their lives. Um, but then also, you know, we see God telling them to always be on God's team. You know, um, okay, yeah, you're you're part of this community. I want you to be part of this community. Uh, I want you to be a blessing to them. But we would remember that we're always on God's team. And so I think if we can keep those lessons in mind, again, it helps us to approach work. So, for example, like being part of the team and 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 things like that. Well. You know, there's some there's some lifestyle choices that some of my teammates make that I, I would not approve of. You know, Scripture doesn't approve of those kinds of things. But I still want to be part of that team because I can't have influence if I just separate myself from that person or those people. That I want to be part of the team. I don't want to adopt their standards or their lifestyles, or their beliefs, their values, but I still want to be among them and be part of them so that I can be an influence in their lives. Um, you know, that story I told about the, the forgiveness, well, that would, uh, you know, like I said, he, he described himself as an atheist. Well, that I would never have had that opportunity to have some kind of influence if I had just said, oh, well, you're an atheist, then forget it. I can't be part of you. You know, God says, hey, be part of the community. So I think it's important for us to really understand that. But again, we're there for a purpose. So always be on mission for God.
I love it. It's such practical advice. I think we would be remiss if we didn't end with maybe pointing out some of the dangers, the pitfalls, the the, the obstacles that we face. The the examples that you've used about Daniel and the Jeremiah, they're they're written to and written about people in exile, people yeah. that are in a sense behind enemy lines. And and we do need to recognize that we are in exile. That doesn't mean, as you said, that we withdraw and we have nothing to do with the people. We say, well, we're Christians and we're we have to be separate. That's what the Pharisees did. They were they were they were separatists. They didn't want to have anything to do with people that weren't like them. So we do want to be on the team, but there are also some dangers when you're living in exile, when you're living as God's people in a foreign land. So help us to to see some yeah. of the dangers we might look out for. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought this up because you're exactly right, and we have to be aware of that. And uh, um, and, and you know that's one of the things that 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 Scripture even encourages us to do is we need to be wise and discerning you know, um, of our environment and people that are around us and things like that. And there are some real dangers. Um, you know, I think about like in Daniel's story, well, part of the danger that he had to face, you know, was that he had people actively (laughs) working against him. That may very well be one of the dangers that, that some of us face as Christ followers. Um, uh, you know, and so we may face, um, some different threats, um, even even you know feeling like we're kind of being ostracized, you know, at work because of our faith and our beliefs and things like that. So there are some real dangers um, that we have to be aware of. But I think one of the biggest dangers is idolatry. I mean, as we know in Scripture, I mean, this is kind of the the foundational sin you know, running throughout, you know, the, the narrative of Scripture. And when you think about idolatry, it's, it's you know, in a, in a simple term or simple way, it's, it's really putting something above God or looking to something or someone instead of God for meaning and fulfillment, um, for comfort even, for strength, things like that. So it's, it's replacing God with something. And so that means that even good things can become idols. And so work is a good thing, but even work can become an idol because I can make work the source of my identity, the source of my fulfillment, the source of my meaning in life and and replace God with work. And so I think we have to be really concerned about the dangers of idolatry in the workplace. And there's, there's several, but three that I've, that I have found and that I've kind of encountered in this transition of mine is, I mean, I guess four, because I just, like I mentioned, I mean, work itself, you know, can become an idol. But I think one workplace idol that we, we need to be really mindful of is the idol of success. And this is where our identity it, we root our identity in our performance rather than in Christ or in God. And, and man, that is so tempting, you know, because we, we want to be good at our jobs. We want to be recognized as being good. We want to be successful. I mean, you know, e- e- even when I was a you know, full-time preacher, I still had that draw. I want to be successful. I want to do good things and good work and things like that. So the same is true in a secular environment. And so it's really intoxicating, you know, to chase success. And so that can be a real danger because now if, if that's where I'm getting my validation is in my achievements and recognitions and awards, well, now, you know, I am subtly, sometimes not so subtly, but I am subtly getting off the Jesus path and I am getting off mission and now... I become self-serving rather than God-serving. So I think success is one of those. I think money, obviously, is a a big-time idol that we have to be careful about. Um, But what's interesting is, and there's all kinds of studies and research about this, is that money is also one of those examples that idols always over-promise and under-deliver. Because there's a ton of research that shows that money does not accomplish what we think it will accomplish in our lives. Um, And yet, 
money can be a big idol. And I also think fitting in is a, is a workplace danger that can become an idol. Um, and, and there, the, to me, the challenge there is, you know, am I trying to please people more than I'm trying to please Christ? What, what am I doing? What's, what's really at the heart of my ambition here? And the reason I, I think of those three things is because in a secular workplace environment, those are kind of the metrics that you measure yourself by is, you know, how successful are you in terms of, you know, titles, promotion, you know, all of those things. How much money, you know, do you make um, is kind of seen as that's that's kind of the symbol of your worth and your value is how much money you make. And then just fitting in and networking and being known, man, that's how people in a secular work environment are measuring themselves. Um, and so I think we have to be careful and not falling ourselves into those traps. And again, that can be really easy to do. Um, and so I think about just in terms of success, we've got to, our standard of success has to be faithfulness. Am I being faithful? You know, I think about like Isaiah and Jeremiah. You know, they're told to be, you know, these messengers for God. But if we were to measure the, their success by the standards we measure preachers today, they would be miserable failures. But they're not failures because their measurement of success was they were faithful. They were faithful to the task that God gave them. And so that's how I want to measure myself. Am I faithful to the task God has given me to carry out in this secular work environment? And if I can stay focused on that, it can help me to not fall prey to these dangers of these workplace idols. Yeah. Oh, that's so helpful. Because I think that even as we were talking about the idea of being on mission for God and and doing this for Jesus and being in the workplace for for the Lord and for influence and and being a positive impact and ministering to other people, I think sometimes we can fool ourselves into thinking that's what we're doing when we're really stoking our own ego, when we're 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 yeah. really doing things for for the selfish, idolatrous reasons. Mm -hmm. And we're telling ourselves, oh, no, no, this is for the Lord. And I, I, I want to be in the in-group in so that I can influence them. And I, I, I want a, a better position because the better position I have, the more people I'll be able to influence it and reach for the Lord. And we tell ourselves that we're doing it for the Lord. But in reality, there's an ulterior motive. Yeah. And I, that's why I think that there's there's so much value in in quiet time, in, mm -hmm. in study of Scripture, in prayer, in, in being introspective. Because we have to examine our own motives yes. and to ask ourselves, I love the question you come back to, faithfulness. Am I being faithful? And and if I am, then I am a success. And the the freedom, the liberty, the joy of knowing that I may not be the, the highest paid employee here. I might not be the, the most well-liked person here. I might not be uh, the, the person with the, the most prestigious job or office, but... I am being faithful to Jesus, and that's what really matters. Absolutely right. And, and like you said, that's something that requires constant introspection and examination. And so one of the things that I do just, just as a simple idea is, um, so I have written out for myself a what I call a workplace startup prayer or a workday startup prayer and a workday shutdown prayer. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm kind of an organized guy. And so, um, but what that, is, what that helps me to do is, so the, I begin my work day with this same prayer, but I've, I've written some specific things in that prayer that I want to be mindful of because it's helping me to start my work day remembering what my real purpose is, where my identity comes from, that, that I want to be an instrument of peace and an ambassador of Christ in this place. And then I end my work day, kind of a way to just kind of turn my brain off from work, you know, is I end my work day with another prayer that, again, is helping me to just kind of evaluate, okay, was I faithful today? You know, was I a good ambassador of Christ today? You know, um, and, and so I think just 
as 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 followers of Christ in these secular environments, facing these real dangers, we've got to put some things into the routines of our day that are helping us to stay on task, helping us to stay on mission, and that in, in, incorporates some of that introspection and examination. Because if I'm not doing that, boy, it can be so easy for me to get sucked into measuring success in a worldly way and and all of those kinds of things. So I, I think the point you made is really good. And I, and I think we need to just in, adopt some disciplines and, and kind of rituals, so to speak, that, that help us to stay on task. I love that. I love the fact that you use the word rituals, that, that there are religious rituals that should be part of our quote unquote secular work. And, right. and really we, we keep using that term secular because we, we, we need sort yeah. of a, a handle to, to talk about it, but it really isn't secular. It is for, for believers. It is religious work. The work that you're doing now is just as religious just as spiritual as the work you were doing before. It's just as much ministry. In fact, Peter calls every believer a royal part of the royal priesthood that we are being priests, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, wh whatever your job, whatever your role, even if you're working at home. My, my wife is a, a stay-at-home mom and she is uh, she's homeschooling our boys, but she is doing a priesthood work. She is doing right. ministry in, yep. in our home. And mm -hmm. if everybody thought of their workplace like that and thought of their work day that way, that I'm going into my realm of ministry where I am going to be a priest for the Lord and I'm going to bring the blessings of God to my coworkers and to the customers and to the people I, I interact with, it would change the way that we do everything. And like you yeah. said, it would expand the work of ministry across every city and every state and every country throughout yep. the world and would be what Jesus calls the kingdom to be, this leaven that is working through the lump of dough. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. It, it changes how we think about our work. Now all of a sudden work is is more exciting. Um, and, and, and so here's an interesting thought. So one of the things that's happening in, in the workplace today, kind of across the board, is there's real there's some real struggles with employee engagement. So you know, a couple of years ago, kind of the the buzzword was quiet quitting, you know, things like that. And um, and so employers are having a real uh, challenge with retaining talented employees, things like that. Well, what's interesting is one of the factors in that is that there's a leadership group called McKinsey uh, and Company and. They recently did a survey and found that 70% of the employees that they surveyed, it was a large survey sample, 70% say that work is their primary source of meaning and fulfillment in life. Okay, now think about this. One of the reasons for that is because here within our country, we've seen kind of the role of the church or the influence of the church and culture has been in decline for some time. Um, you know, we're really shifting from, you know, kind of a, a religious culture to now very non-religious, you know, in, in a lot of ways. So what that means is that fewer people are looking to God as a source of meaning. And so if you don't have God, where does that come from? Well, it, work is kind of the only place that it can come from. But work cannot deliver what God is meant to deliver and what only God can deliver. And so I think there's a lot of people that they're frustrated by work because that's the only place they're looking for meaning and fulfillment. And they're disappointed, you know, um, and disgruntled and all of those kinds of things. And so they're really frustrated with work. And it's because they're looking to work to provide them with something that only their creator can do. Okay, so as followers of Jesus, we get this. But again, we can be tempted to make work the source of our meaning and our fulfillment. We can be just as tempted to do that as others. But when we keep work in its proper perspective, like what we've been talking about, 
Now work is energizing. And I can also deal with the frustrations at work in a more positive and productive way because work is not the ultimate source of my meaning or even my of my identity. And, and so I think if we can put work back in its scriptural perspective, I think not only will we be more satisfied, we'll be more energized at work, but also we'll be able to see how the kingdom of God and the opportunities we have to be on mission for the kingdom are, are literally all around us. And we can take more advantage of that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. What a great place to stop. Rusty, thank you for this conversation and thank you for your work in the kingdom, brother. Well, thank you, Wes. I love the podcast, love what you're doing. So keep on going, brother. Thanks, brother. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Christian Bible Study Podcast. If you have just a moment, we would love for you to go and rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening. It really does help more people to find this content. I want to thank each and every one of the guests who join me every week for these Bible studies. Beth Tabor, who volunteers her time to transcribe this podcast, each and every one of you for listening, and our entire McDermott Road Church family who makes this podcast possible. Now, let's all go out and love like Jesus.